Hello, this is Pastor Bob Dickerson from the First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois, and we welcome you to our uh, Explore the Bible uh, series. This is the May 16th lesson, 2021, session 11, and this is produced by Lifeway Christian Resources. The lesson is entitled Sacrifice from the text found in Luke the 23rd chapter, verses 33 through 46. And to summarize it, we might say Jesus' death provides salvation to all who trust in him. I want you to imagine with me for just a few moments that time travel was possible, and you were able to go back to the days just after Jesus ascended into heaven. And let's say people were admiring your modern-day clothing and began to ask you about your shoes and, and uh, maybe the jeans you were wearing. Uh, uh, and, and then they noticed that around your neck you had some jewelry. And they kind of stepped back a moment because you were wearing a cross. And they might look at you and wonder if you were a sadist or, a, or mentally disturbed because you were wearing an instrument of death around your neck. Why would anybody do that? It, it would be the equivalent today of wearing an electric chair uh, uh, jewelry around your neck. Uh, and it's amazing when you think of it because Jesus took an instrument of death and made it into a symbol of faith and a symbol, a symbol of overwhelming love through sacrifice. So when we wear a cross, we're wearing it not just because it's shiny, but we're wearing it because of the great sacrifice that Jesus did for us so that we could be in relationship with God. So why is the cross important? Well, Jesus' death on the cross provided a way for people to come to God. Everyone is accountable for their sin, which separates us from God. Jesus' death paid the penalty for our sin and removed the separation between God and humankind. Without the cross, there would be no possibility for forgiveness of sin for everyone in the world. In today's lesson, we're going to see the interaction between Jesus and the thieves who were crucified on either side of him. One mocked Jesus, yet he continued to show love toward the, the thief, and, and, and even in the midst of agony he was experiencing, he showed love and respect for the other. That kind of love is also a symbol. The way Christians treat each other also points to our faith in Christ. John 13, 35 says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Uh, Luke six thirty five says, But love your enemies. Do what is good and, and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High for he is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. So, we're going to be looking at what Jesus did for this world today. And we're going to begin by uh, talking about focused. Luke 23, 33 through 34. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. I want you to notice some facts that uh, we learn in this verse. First of all, Jesus was crucified uh, with a criminal on either side of him. Jesus called on the Father to forgive the people that were present since they didn't understand what was going on or what they were actually doing. And Jesus was focused on his purpose of providing for the forgiveness of sin. So here's some questions we want to focus on. How was the crucifixion intended to be the ultimate humiliation for Jesus? From the Roman perspective, Jesus stood accused of sedition, not blasphemy, which was a civil crime, not a religious one. The two men who were killed along with Jesus are identified in, in some translations, as I mentioned a moment ago, as thieves, but the word can also mean insurgents. And this might support the idea that uh, a crucifixion was a political weapon used to send a message to those who were still living. And the message was simply this, do not stir dissent or this will be the result. 
There is also evidence that Jesus' arrest was part of a broader pattern of violence and fear of revolt <coughs> uh, that, uh, that particular Passover in um, circa A.D. 33. Uh, Barabbas' presence fuels the theory that Pilate was concerned with rebels and had already confronted an insurrection before he interrogated Jesus. Some think that uh, the sign that was affixed to Jesus' cross that said the king of the Jews in different languages was intended, was intended rather to taunt the religious leaders. Others think it was a scornful signal to the crowds that this death awaits any person who declares uh, him or herself to be a, a king or queen in, instead of, uh, of Caesar. Of course, we who believe Jesus is the Son of God believe it showed just how far God was willing to go to provide a loving and righteous way for humankind to be reconciled with him. With all the pain involved, it's easy to miss the fact that Jesus' clothes were taken and his body was exposed before the crowd. I want you to imagine with me how humiliating that would be for us if we were treated the same way and lifted up uh, to be portrayed naked or nearly naked before a conservative culture in, in Jerusalem. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Uh, some translations, the Christian Standard uh, Bible, says we did not value him. Wow. When you look at a culture that does not value Jesus, that culture d deserves judgment. And I think as we pray for our culture, we need to pray for respect. We need, we need respect in our nation today. And we see so little of it, whether it's uh, toward uh, government officials or toward the police or, or, or toward teachers or toward parents. We've lost that. We need it back, especially respecting what the Son of God did for us on the cross. So how did Jesus demonstrate his purpose while on the cross? His purpose was to provide a way for people to be justifiably and righteously forgiven for their sins. And I'm repeating that in different ways, but I want you to know that not even the devil would try to argue that the death of the Son of God on the torturous cross was not payment enough. So, the application is simply this. Jesus' purpose of providing forgiveness of sin must remain central. In a, a book of forgiving God in an unforgiving world, Ron Lee Davis retells the uh, true story of a priest in the Philippines. He was a much-loved man of God who carried the burden of a secret sin he had committed many years before. Uh, he had repented of it, of course, but still he had no peace about it. No sense of God's forgiveness. In his parish, there came a time when there was a woman who deeply loved God who claimed to have visions in which she spoke with Christ and he with her. The priest, however, was skeptical and detested her. He said, the next time you speak with Christ, I want you to ask him what sin your priest committed while he was in seminary. The woman agreed. A few days later, the priest asked, well, did Christ visit you in your dreams? Yes, he did, she replied. And did you ask what sin I committed in seminary? Yes. Well, what did he say? He said, I don't remember. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Hebrews 10, 17. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, these <clears throat> passages make it evident that Jesus does not remember our sin. However, God's not remembering is not the same as forgetting. God is omniscient. He knows everything, and he forgets nothing. However, he can choose not to remember something. Do you hear what I said? He can choose not to remember something. And if you have sinned or someone has sinned against you, the devil makes sure you will not forget. But in Christ's power, you can choose not to remember. The second point that we see in this lesson and in this passage is mocked. 
Luke 23, 35 through 39. I am reading from the Christian Standard Bible, which says, The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself as this, if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above. Uh, him. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Well, as Jesus hung on the cross, the crowd, the religious leaders, the soldiers, and even one of the prisoners on the cross mocked him. How did Jesus' love for the people still shine through? Rather than trying to defend himself, Jesus showed love to the mockers. God wants us to show love to everyone, even those who don't show love to us in return. You can see that in Matthew 5, 44. Showing love sometimes means speaking the truth in love, and at other times it means choosing not to respond at all when we are being insulted. The application to this point is Jesus is the Christ regardless of what others may say or who happens to be mocking him. God cannot be anyone other than he is. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I was talking with a man while waiting uh, for a table at Bob Evans this past week, and and he was reading a book called uh, Darwin's Doubt. And Robin, uh, who was sitting there with me, asked, uh, Well, what's that about? And he gave a short summary of all the theories that Darwin came up with that have been dispelled by DNA research and that the odds of something like that that Darwin described happening was uh, the chance was 1 in 10 and 73 more zeros. 73 more zeros, okay? 10 to the 73rd power. He got called to his table, but he said, you know, there must be an intelligent designer, to which I said, amen to that. People believe a lot of things these days, and God gives them the freedom to accept or or reject him. But regardless of what people choose to believe or not believe, what they choose to call truth and what they choose to not believe, doesn't matter. Jesus is the Christ, regardless, the Messiah, the one who died for our sins. The third uh, point is trusted. We see that in Luke 23, verses 40 through 43. But the other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God, since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So one criminal mocked Jesus and the other defended Jesus uh, in the sense that he knew they deserved their punishment, but Jesus did not. So how do the criminal's reactions to Jesus mirror kind of reactions people have toward Jesus today? Well, Matthew and Mark, if you go into their Gospels, wrote that both criminals insulted Jesus at first, but Luke indicates that as time passed, one criminal changed his mind and defended Jesus by rebuking the other criminal for mocking him. One doubted that Jesus was the Messiah, and he said, save yourself and us. He believed uh, in the afterlife because if Jesus was dead, he could not help. So, It's hard to say what happened to change the other's mind about Jesus. Maybe it was the words he heard him say or the way Jesus was dealing with dying. We don't know if the words uh, that were recorded were the only words that he said. He might have said other things to this man. They were just the words of the Holy Spirit inspired the gospel writers to record. But we don't know if he had given a further witness that turned one of the thieves around to where he come to believe in Jesus. We detect from the criminal's words that he placed his faith in Jesus. He began by admitting he deserved the punishment and he placed his faith in Jesus to help him to be admitted into his kingdom. So what does Jesus' response show about his treatment toward people? Jesus is willing to receive anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith. 
We know that from John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way to the Father and that he desires that all come to him in faith regardless of their backgrounds or their paths. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So when the Hebrew scholars translated the Old Testament into Greek, uh, they used the word paradise 11 times to refer to the Garden of Eden. And we get from that that uh, paradise is the place where God is. So the application is Jesus can be trusted as the way to the Father. Let me remind you of what John 14, 6 says. Uh, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our lesson writer said this, the fact that Jesus made this promise in his last moments proves that he knew death would not have the last word. Even on the cross, Jesus' authority was fully expressed in that promise. Even death was powerless to stop him. The suffering servant is also the sovereign king. This incident reminds us of the truth that's found in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. How did that thief get to go to paradise? By faith in Jesus Christ and the gift of salvation given to him by God through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. The last point for this lesson is sacrificed, and it's uh, Luke 23 through uh, Luke 23 verses 44 through 46. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until 3 because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle and Jesus called out with a with a loud voice, "Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit." Saying this, he breathed his last so after about three hours of darkness in the midday, the curtain of the sanctuary split as Jesus entrusted his spirit into the hands of the Father. And then Jesus died. So what did the events surrounding Jesus' death signify? Well, let's start with darkness. The darkness showed God's divine judgment on sin. John 3 I'm sorry, Joel 3, verses 14 and 15 says, multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will cease their shining Jesus himself had associated God's judgment with, uh, for sin with darkness Matthew 24 29 says immediately after the distress of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken so when God judged sin it seemed all of creation participated. So what did the events surrounding Jesus' death signify in the second place? Well, well, what happened in the sanctuary? What happened in the temple? The curtain that separated the holy place from what was called the holy of holies uh, in the tabernacle and later in the temple was torn by something otherworldly. Now this is some wonderful news when you understand the significance. The holy of holy represent uh, the Holy of Holies represented the presence of God himself. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. This symbolized God giving believers access to himself due to the Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Access. What did the events surrounding Jesus' death signify? Well, what about his last words? The last words of Jesus uh, he quoted scripture. There's, there's some of the times that he was on the cr cross, some of the phrases that he used, uh, like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, that was quoting scripture. Now he quotes scripture again. This is Psalm 31, five, where it says, into your hand, I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. This signifies Jesus's fulfillment of God's plan and God's will. Jesus repeats these words as he dies on the cross. Just as the psalmist entrusts himself to God as he suffers, Jesus entrusts himself to God the Father as he dies. In Luke, this phrase emphasizes Jesus' willingness to submit himself 
to his Father's will. God's honor is not bound up in preserving us from death. Let me repeat that. God's honor is not bound up in preserving us from death, but in preserving us through death. Never, ever forget that. Jesus' death removes the barrier between holy God and sinful humanity. Have you ever been denied entrance because a barrier was in your way? I remember going to a house when I pastored in the country uh, around Lick Creek, uh, and I rode, I, I rode up down a gravel road and a gravel driveway to this house. And as I started to get out, a huge dog came around the corner uh, to meet me. Fortunately, the owner came out, and I was not the dog's afternoon snack. Uh, and I was granted access because the owner said to the dog, let him alone, it's just a preacher. Well, what have we learned today? Well, Jesus' death provides salvation to all who trust in him. Jesus' purpose of providing forgiveness of sin must remain central in our message. Jesus is the Christ regardless of what others may say. And Jesus can be trusted as the way to the Father because Jesus' death removes the barrier between holy God and sinful humanity. I want to tell you a story. I bet you've heard it before, but uh, it kind of makes a point that I want to end with today. This is the story of Chippy the parakeet. He never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage. The next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problems began when Chippy's uh, owner decided to clean out uh, Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. Not recommended if the bird's still in there. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage, and, and her phone rang, so she dug it out of her pocket, and, and she turned, and as she uh, uh, picked it up, she barely ha- said hello when all of a sudden she realized she had left the vacuum in the cage, and she heard this, and Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner gasped, put down the uh, phone, turned off the vacuum, opened the bag, and there was Chippy, still alive but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him up and raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. Then, realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She searched for the hairdryer and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, Uh, The reporter who initially had written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. And she said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. It's not hard to see why. Sucked in, washed up, and blown over. Well, that's enough to steal the song from the stoutest heart. And, you know, living in our culture today, we kind of get that. We're kind of feeling like that. You know, as I'm uh, 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 doing this recording, uh, there's talk of a big gas shortage uh, in the eastern part of the United States. And, uh, you know, that's kind of scary. For those of us who have lived in gas shortage, through gas shortages before, not fun. Not fun. It, that's the way it was like before Jesus. This world will do all of that and more to you. But because of Jesus, we now have access to God, the creator of the universe. He is my barrier breaker. He is my way to abundant life here on earth and, and heaven in the future. I and all believers are beneficiaries of his sacrifice. Praise be to God. Jesus' death provides salvation to all who trust him. And anything that would separate us from God, whether it was a veil in the temple or whether it's sin we have committed, that was all conquered and torn by the death of Jesus on the cross. Praise God, hallelujah. I sure hope that you have been saved and that barrier has been torn down in your life. And now, you have access. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you have access to God.
Let's pray together. Father, I do come to you thanking you for this day that you've given us. I do pray, Father, that uh, uh, we will worship you for the access that we have to you through Jesus. And Lord, if there's anybody listening to my voice that doesn't know you, I pray today would be the day that they would admit their sin, they would ask forgiveness of their sin, they would tell Jesus they believe in him, and that they would ask Jesus to save them because they believe in him and that he rose from the dead and is the Son of God. Lord, I pray that if anybody prays that prayer watching this, that they would simply call and allow us, Father, to minister to them and disciple them and show them how much God loves them and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. For that we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.